Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very proud to present the 2014-15 concert season, and it's a great joy to see so many friends, colleagues, and artists in the hall this afternoon. 2013 was an extraordinary year for Wigmore Hall with our highest attendance ever, some 200,000 tickets in total, maintaining and enhancing our 60% increase in attendance across all of our programmes, artistic and learning, since 2005. At the outset, I must acknowledge the outstandingly generous contribution made by all of our friends who raised the vital 1.2 million pounds that we need each season to underpin the ever-expanding artistic remit of the whole across some 425 concerts and 400 learning and educational events every year. Uh, your essential support bridges the gap between ticket revenue and our running costs, and we need your ongoing help now as much as ever. We have energy and determination that belies our modest resources and we get things done effectively and with conviction. Wigmore Hall stands as a major supporter of contemporary chamber music and song, as a commissioner of new works and as a champion of living composers. The Hall is determined to bring creative, fresh energy to the repertoire, not least uh, UK and London premieres. And our commissioning scheme is already one of the most ambitious and extensive in Europe for chamber music. We plan to present more than 25 commissions in the season ahead, and I'm very pleased that our current uh, composer in residence, the celebrated Julian Anderson, joins us here today. Uh, at almost 115 years of age, we're looking forward to a very energetic future and a widely expanded program and to what I refer to in the office as growing old disgracefully, uh, covering everything from the core traditions of the whole to bracing modernity and the experimental cutting edge. But we simply can't be disgraceful without all of you. If you value us, I appeal to you to back us and to join us in our fundraising ambitions. We're all custodians of this historic hall and collectively, as music lovers, we must work hard now to ensure that the hall's future is just as vibrant and relevant as its past. Last season, I announced that we had created the Wigmore Hall Endowment Fund to invest in the development of many more inspirational and significant projects and residencies and programs with the world's leading performers and ensembles. This all came about thanks to Arts Council England's Catalyst Endowment Award, which in Wigmore Hall's case pledged to match all donations to the fund up to one million pounds. The original deadline to do this was May 2015, and today I'm very pleased to confirm that we've already reached that one million pound target and I warmly thank all of you for getting us there so quickly. This first milestone is a great moment for the Hall to move forward and also to set new goals for the years ahead. Uh, the endowment fund is for the long term and our aim is to reach seven million pounds by 2020, uh, an ambitious target perhaps, but one to which we must aspire and plan for. Uh, 2020 is already in my sights in any case with a major Beethoven celebration around the 250th anniversary of his birth, but I'll talk about all of that in another speech. Uh, throughout the 20th century, and in recent years too, there has been an intense debate over the appropriate relationship between the arts and society. The debate can be traced in every art form, from painting and sculpture and literature to music, drama and film. And on such a subject, opinions obviously differ. The reflection developed by the political leader and playwright Václav Havel on theatre, for example, is one worth dwelling upon. For Havel, theatrical performance was worthwhile insofar as it was capable of bringing a group of people into a new understanding of themselves. A single performance for a few dozen people, he wrote, 
uh, can be incomparably more important than a television serial viewed and talked about by the entire country. The same can be said of Wigmore Hall. We never forget that night after night, 550 people sit in this hall, and the tens and thousands of you who help us to fill this place most nights and days of the week are at the heart of everything that we do. To experience intimate music making in live performance is still the most important element for a listener, and looking after all of you, our live audience, is my first priority. But reaching countless thousands of listeners or viewers will form an ongoing and important priority in the years ahead too. Sometimes we broadcast to a radio and internet audience of millions. Our CD label is now available in 30 international territories, bringing the unique Wigmore Hall concert experience to listeners worldwide. And last year, a series of concerts were broadcast on Sky Arts TV. Wigmore Hall is not about making profit. It's about making music, music that is the most ambitious and rewarding that music can be. The type of music that's not about social cachet or glib marketing or notions of prestige or excellence, where real qualities are missing, qualities of depth, abundance and intensity of vision. It's not about fashion or this or that sociological agenda. It's about the enduring richness and integrity of its practice about loyalty to the invisible world of the imagination and the spontaneous movement of the heart. Above all, it's about staying true to our conviction and to the great traditions of this hall. Wigmore Hall's flagship learning programme reaches its 20th anniversary in 2014, and it's wonderful to see how the programme has grown in the last two decades, with a long list of artists who've taken part, and significant numbers of people of all ages who have been introduced to chamber music and to Wigmore Hall for the very first time. Wigmore Hall is particularly committed to this programme because it stems directly from the core value of sharing great music with a broad audience, and it sometimes challenges perceptions of what chamber music looks like, what it sounds like, where it happens, who makes it, and who listens to it. So each year, over 100 schools and nurseries take part and get involved in the Wigmore Hall program. And thousands of young people also come to evening concerts for free as part of Chamber Zone. And this will expand even more in 2014 and 15 with ongoing assistance from the Cavatina Chamber Music Trust. Music for Life, our program for people living with dementia will be expanding out of London in 2014. I am particularly proud of the work we do here and delighted that we can now share this very important experience on a national scale. And later this year, Eilish Tynan, well known to the audience here, uh, joins the Heath Quartet in a concert for people living with dementia and their friends, families, and their carers. And now for the bit that you all came to hear, the unveiling of the 2014-15 uh, concert season. Uh, hailed by the gramophone as a transformative presence in the arts, Joyce Di Donato is one of today's finest singers. She launches the season in partnership with her pianist, one Sir Antonio Papano. The first week of the season also includes Sir Thomas Allen's 70th birthday recital, as well as exciting concerts and recitals in our piano, string quartet, and early music series. Chamber music is at the heart of everything that we do, and we're committed to presenting the most talented international chamber musicians and providing opportunities for new and emerging artists. And we have now, thanks to your support, one of the most important chamber music series in the world today. I'm delighted that the Pavel Haas Quartet, an outstanding champion of Czech music, will bring a celebratory Bohemia series to us next season. We also have the Elias Quartet's Beethoven Cycle, which starts next Thursday to a packed house, and that will continue uh, throughout 1415. And our associate artists, the Takash Quartet, 
bring us a series shaped by the great Viennese classical tradition. Many other great quartets join us throughout the season, but we greatly look forward to the next Wigmore Hall International String Quartet competition, which takes place in March 2015, and this is where you can hear up-and-coming talented quartets from all over the world. Uh, the Nash Ensemble, Chamber Ensemble in Residence, and Standard Bearer for British Music Making across the globe celebrates a remarkable 50 years since it was first formed. And since its origins in the early 1500s, the viola has played a crucial role in the development of chamber music. A very special viola day offers a chance to journey through five centuries of the instrument's development with Tabea Zimmerman and many friends. Clarinetist Martin Frost is our artist in residence and you can experience his tireless sense of curiosity and determination to create deeply personal interpretations of everything from Brahms to Bartok and Kurtai. The fruit yielded by your investment in us and in the endowment fund becomes apparent in two new major projects. Mozart's chamber music takes centre stage over the next two seasons at the Hall. The Mozart Odyssey, some 23 concerts in total, launches in September with Christian Besutenot's survey of the piano sonatas on Forte Piano, and it unfolds with an evening with the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra, recitals by the Hagen Quartet, and the first part of Alina Ibragimova and Cedric Tiberi Guillen's five concert account of the sonatas for violin and piano. Also spread over two seasons and something very close to my heart, a magnificent Purcell retrospective series celebrates the genius of Henry Purcell and the enduring power of his music to move and to inspire. The 16, the English concert, the Gabrielli consort, the early opera company, Carlin Sampson and Trevor Pinnock are amongst the glittering lineup of performers set to explore Purcell's art in the very first year of that two-year project alone. And local schools will be also part of the celebrations with a community chamber programme that retells the story of King Arthur with elements of Purcell's music and newly commissioned material drawing together an array of different community groups uh, with musicians and singers from the early opera company. So these are two major enterprises which would never have been possible without all that additional investment. A long list of prestigious prizes and awards reflects the esteem in which Paul Lewis's artistry is held worldwide. Uh, he took a break from us last year and we're delighted to welcome him back and to celebrate his fruitful association with, with this hall uh, in Paul Lewis, A Celebration, which offers a broad look at his, at his artistry as a chamber musician, a song accompanist, and a solo recitalist. We also mark the legendary pianist Maria Jao Pirish's 70th birthday year in October with a portrait series in which she plays chamber music alongside a much anticipated return solo recital. Our early music and baroque series continues to go from strength to strength and following their 40th anniversary season, the English concert returns and we're very pleased to welcome the concert's artistic director and guiding light, Harry Bickett, to our launch here this afternoon. Robert Fairfax, born in 1464 in Lincolnshire, rose from the ranks of English provincial musicians to become one of the most important composers in the reigns of both Henry VII and Henry VIII. The Cardinal's music and Andrew Carwood will celebrate Fairfax's important work in three concerts, setting his Latin sacred compositions within the context of the religious and political landscape of early Tudor England. And history will be made at Wigmore Hall in December when the Hilliard Ensemble gives its final performance. The group's farewell programme spans nine centuries of music, including Arvel Perth's Most Holy Mother of God, written for and dedicated to them. And the much-loved Stile Antico will bring in the new year 2015 on New Year's Eve with a very special seasonal programme. A glance at 
Florian Bosch's biography soon reveals the stratospheric achievements of his early career. The Austrian baritone has already made his mark on the opera stage and above all, stands firmly amongst the ranks of today's finest leader singers. And his residency includes works by composers all born in the Austrian Empire. We also look forward to Ian Bostridge in Schubert with Julius Drake and watch out for his first ever Wigmore Hall Live CD, also a Schubert recital, and you'll hear a little extract from that CD before you leave today. Uh, the Prince Consort, founded and directed by pianist Alistair Hogarth, joins forces with Malcolm Martineau for Schumann's Spanish Love Songs of 1849. Henk Nevin is a remarkable young baritone already making a huge impact on the audience here, so look forward to many more appearances from him over the seasons ahead, and I'm glad to say he's amongst us somewhere in the audience today, fresh from Amsterdam. Uh, I'm very excited about a new programme, Voices at Wigmore, which invites you to support vocal concerts, contributing towards the costs of promoting either an acclaimed vocal ensemble or a great leader voice, or, or perhaps an emerging singer such as Hank Nevin, or early song repertoire, as it was heard in Purcell's time. Uh, of course, it's been impossible for me to mention everything in the season ahead. And thank you all once again for all that you do for Wigmore Hall. And I appeal to you, if you believe in us, please back us and help us reach our 115th birthday in 2016 in a stronger position than ever. Thank you very much indeed. Das Meer. 
Oh, yeah. 